Well, hi, good morning, and thanks for joining me here in my shop for a little bit of work that this oscilloscope needs. Today is today is January 6th. Um, so the problem with this scope is pretty simple stuff. Uh, it's not too exciting. It's, both of these connectors have come loose here. Okay, uh, that's hobbling this oscilloscope, which I use. This oscilloscope, uh, not, not in my shop these days. It's, it's in another location, um, and I do make use of it. Uh, it's an okay scope. It's a 10 megahertz uh, scope. Works fine otherwise. Certainly good enough for, for my use, but sooner or later, and I think sooner is the word, I'm going to plug the uh, BNC connector in here and just rip this off. Plus, the grounding is becoming very iffy, especially on this connector. Half the time it's not, not grounding to the cabinet. So it's really becoming unusable simply because of these. So what I hope to do is simply tighten them up. But since I've got it here in my shop, I think I'll probably take the time to investigate it a little bit further, look it over inside. There's some adjustments that can be made, some alignment or com compensators that can be adjusted and maybe make it operate just a little better than it does than it does now. So that's the plan. I'm going to get the uh, cabinet off of it and we'll take a look inside. Uh, first, whoop, first thing I'll do is fix the uh, fix these things. That'll be my first objective. Well, maybe we'll look around a little bit first. It's got a life of its own. One of the great things about vintage test equipment is uh, they are better built than the commercial stuff, uh, radios and whatnot for the consumer market. So even though a guy like this might be fairly old, there's a good chance most of the components, and maybe all of them, are still in fairly good shape. So uh, let's just take a look at what we can see here. Uh, so a couple interesting things right away. It looks like the transistors are in uh, sockets on here. Um, things look really nice inside. Not built up with dust, which is good. I'm a little surprised. Chances are most of the components are of a higher quality, as I just mentioned. And uh, generally a better built device, of course. You're going to make devices for use in electronics uh, laboratories and shops and whatnot. Uh, the guys using them know what they're doing. Maybe a little more than me. <laughs> so you're not going to get away with anything. And any deg degradation of its operation earlier in its life, and the word's going to go out uh, that, hey, don't don't buy anything from a company like I won't name this one, there's no reason to. Um, just a couple of interesting things. Look at this this guy strapped onto the bracket here. And there's another one down here strapped onto the bracket. So this is either just for cooling, it's probably the case, um, or it may be a, this may be a thermal sensor of some sort to detect overheating in it. I don't know, offhand. Probably again, it's probably just using this as a, a large heat sink. You can see some heat sinks here. So I'm looking quickly for any discolored components, uh, anything that obviously looks to be in trouble. Again, probably the design involved using, um, let me say, strong parts, um, not undersizing the wattage of parts, especially resistors and things like that. Lots and lots of electrolytic capacitors. Look at that. There's just a whack of them in there. You know, the light over here get a little better look. There's just a whack of them in there. Oh boy. But uh, I'm not trying to restore this. I'm trying to keep it operating. And uh, it doesn't have to be working in a precise way for me to get use out of it. So probably not an issue. There's big, big capacitors back here, which are probably for the, you know, for the power supply, which you can see the transformer there. OK, so I'm just looking down this board to try to spot anything that looks of order. Oh, 
all looks pretty good. A little hard to see in the camera, maybe. Okay. It's interesting if I used uh, some plastic spacers on the wires down here. Keep the wires apart. Looks like a little package here. Um, this is where a number of components, mostly capacitors, have been sealed into a single piece. Here's another one right here. That may not be the case. Maybe it's just a square capacitor, but I, I think it, well, how many leads are on it? Yeah, you know what? There's, there's only a couple of leads. You know, this is the high voltage lead to uh, that charges the front of the of the CRT. Uh, there's going to be some thousands of volts on this. That's why the large cable. See it come right into this board here. Danger, danger there. There's an interesting piece of uh, cable they've used. 300 looks like 300 ohm cable to me. This is probably carrying uh, potentially some higher frequency signal back to the uh, back of the tube where the uh, Tube, tube socket is uh, probably the uh, ho horizontal deflection, probably because it's a very high frequency. Not much at all over here. Danger. Important notice. We better read the important notice. What's the important notice here? This cathode ray tube has been manufactured to precise limits and incorporates a number of glass to metal seals. Extreme care must be exercised when handling in order to avoid accidentally damaging damage to the glass surface or Dis distorting, distorting any metal projection, which may, it's very hard to read, which may result in the bulb, maybe that's puncture, or possible implosion. Thorn radio valves and tubes limited, looks like GI. G, 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 I? Is that, what's GI? Georgia? I don't know what that is. There's a sticker up here. GA16, and he's written 16. Probably be an inspector, or the guy who signs off on the machine at the end of the assembly line after putting it through some tests. Maybe he's the guy who also uh, did the final adjustments to bring everything uh, into proper balance. Some of those adjustments are available right on the front. There's a balance adjustment here, right on the front, because it needs to be done with some regularity. Shame on me. I've really done nothing with this scope. Hey, where'd I get this scope? Do you believe? Years ago, I jumped in my car to drive to work in the morning. And when I went around the corner, there sitting at the end of somebody's driveway was this. They were obviously offering it out to the public. So I did my duty and I grabbed it. And I was pretty excited when I got it home and discovered it worked just fine. There's another electrolytic capacitor here. I would never rush in and change all that kind of stuff unless there's a reason to do it. Because, boy, have I learned the lesson of uh, doing unnecessary work causes unnecessary problems. And I have learned that lesson so many times. So I'm really gun shy. Here's. Uh, I thought this was tape, but it's not. So you wouldn't normally find any electrical tape inside something like this. Electrical tape is just no good in the long run. They just use rubber, bits of rubber hose and the like. Now the connectors I'm after, one is right here. Look at this, there's a hole, there's a metal plate here that's, that's also come loose. Sure, looks like the wire's broken. We'll take a closer look in, in a moment. And this is the one I've been using lately. Just as loose as can be. 
what, what, okay, I see how that is. So it has an unusual nut on it. Let's do a little close-up look through this thing. See what we can spot here. Now, is my camera on autofocus? No. Good. Okay, we'll start by looking right at the problem area, which is the back of this connector. Oop. Somebody ringing my doorbell. It's up here. Up here, Jim. Here's one right here. Yeah, now that lead wire with the resistor. Ooh, the resistor looks a little cooked. Doesn't it? The lead wire is either hanging by a thread or it's already broken off there. It's easy to see how to tighten it though. It's just, it's just a simple... Well, it's not simple. It's an unusual looking uh, fastener. But no big deal to tighten it up. And I'm sure this one's exactly the same. Well, in this case, the wire's clearly still soldered. This, the, this thing, can this rotate into trouble? close but I had no idea such a plate was in the back of this doesn't look like it can rotate into trouble so is that resistor fried what is that it's 2 2 uh, black a 22 22 ohm resistor with it might be a gold band on it up here, well, it disappears into the through the hole in the board there. Let's see if we can find it. Uh oh, just a sec here. My uh, camera cable is caught. There we go. Tired of watching videos where they clip out microseconds of hesitation and things like that and turn it into. I don't do that. Well, it's pretty busy to, to get back under there. Wow, from here? Wow, we're not going to get in there. So we're not going to know the condition of that. Uh, if there is a resistor there, there probably is. Probably exactly the same. Both, both coming in. I don't have any problem with the uh, switches in this. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. They all seem to be quite reliable. Lighting it from behind. See, you know, see the bent white, like the coiled up wires and stuff like that? Um, that stuff's all done with, I imagine, a fair bit of precision. You get in and start poking around with that stuff. End up uh, if you bend something like that, it's pretty hard to ever bend it back to the way it was. Well, while we got the close-up camera, let's just keep going here. So those little capacitors worry me a little bit. I'm looking for any discolored part. Anything overheated, any discoloration on the board. The components are spaced out quite a bit. They're not packed in very tight. It's another thing about test equipment. It's true of a lot of console stereos too. There was no need to cram everything down as tight as possible. Oh, look at those, look at those. R17 looks a little a shadow? Maybe that's just a shadow. Let me change the lighting here. Just a shadow. A couple 
couple of adjustments. Capacitor there. Could be a test point, 27, all ALT, alt, don't know what that is. These high wattage resistors don't appear to be hard worked. Which is what I mean, they uh, tend to, to put in the correct size of stuff. They don't skimp. There's no skimping, that'd be the word for it. Don't skimp on this technology because Right, if a company's got this scope in their operation, and if the scope fails, they can't continue operating unless they want to have spare scopes around, which maybe they would, but mostly they just don't want their test equipment to fail. They don't want it to go off track. They don't want a hassle there. They want to have something they know they can rely on, which, which is why these old guys are still in operating condition. You know, I have five oscilloscopes. God God knows how I've ended up with five oscilloscopes. Well, I do know. This one I got off somebody's front yard. Uh, another one was kindly sent to me. The, the one I usually use in my shop was kindly sent to me uh, from someone, which I, this one I use all the time. This one does have a problem. This one, the trigger won't trigger on it. It's actually a big, big hassle. <laughs> Okay, so how about this hot guy? He's gonna get hot. You think that silicone is still? Yeah, look at it. it's still kind of soft. I, I could could restore the silicone a bit. That's kind of low risk type stuff. Oh my gosh! <laughs> That's my new doorbell. It's me stepping on the. Uh, uh, oh, there's a fuse right there. Okay, where's the power cord? Power cord's coming in way down the other corner. Down the other corner. And then it's running up, looks like it's running up to the front to where there's a, a switch. The fuse up here, so I'm guessing, it looks like a small fuse. But this may be the power fuse, but it may be a fuse in the high voltage system. I doubt that. It's kind of an awkward place to have high voltage on. It's probably just the fuse. Good to know it's there. And some colorful transistors there. A little, a little more packed on this board. Adjustments of some sort. Large wattage resistors all looking really nice. Oh, here's some more uh, transistors on a heat sink. Well, that's an interesting arrangement. It looks like they've gone a long ways to make sure the uh, this tab on the transistor is not grounded. Yet somehow they want to deliver the heat out of it. And uh, this looks like a plastic screw here. Yeah. So these guys are probably at, at some risk from uh, not being cooled well. Okay, got uh, those look like uh, carbon. Is that rubber or is that? It's rubber. Just, just, just rubber. So. You think the currents would be fairly high in this area on the board? Maybe another component has uh, overheated, but it doesn't look like it. Looks like everything looks good. Now, there's just in this view, there's quite a few different types of uh, resistors. There's that one right in the center. Uh, it doesn't look the same as any others. That guy got replaced. I have no idea the history of this thing. You know, like there wasn't a letter with it on the driveway. <laughs> but every other resistor looks different. Than that one right there. It just has the look of being replaced too. Let's see if we can get around the other side and look at it. 
gain. Oh, wait a minute. Here's one over here. They said something about this is a high current area, perhaps. And it looks like there could be two replaced resistors. on the resistor here. Shine the light. Yeah, that's not helping very much, is it? I think. Hard to say. The one I'm looking for is a reworked solder. Closer. Now I'm going to be confused. Which way is up? Too too tight to get a nice shot here. So this this board looks like it went through a solder bath, or somehow solder got on the traces here, and then each individual component was soldered or resoldered. In the manufacturer. Just taking a wild guess. I don't really know that to be the case, but uh, just looking at the way the solder is. Okay, what's going on with this? Uh, where did it go? Zig, zigzaggy. Yeah, my camera's upside down, so I'm having trouble steering it. Zigzaggy part there. just wires. It's just wires and they have, uh, those, those aren't rubber, are they? No, these are uh, uh, pieces of, uh, and I can't think of the word for it now, magnetic material. So I think this twist you see here, it's just the technician pulling the wire tight by taking up slack. Oh, it's those ones with the uh, spacers so got to be some high voltage on these I think now often the high voltage components and wires collect dust and identify themselves that way but there's not enough dust in here to do that it's just going right to the back of the CRT good okay nothing in there that really Makes me think a lot of work is in store, not at all. I think all I gotta do really is tighten up those guys and then we'll play around with testing it out, making sure it's uh, properly adjusted. I mean, the, the, so the readings are uh, a little more accurate than they might be right now. Um, that's what we'll do. Well, I keep the camera rolling while I tighten up that part. Now, how am I gonna do that exactly? one. Oh, yeah, see I just pushed a little bit on the wire and it popped right off. That's that's a bit of a problem. It's not like there's excess wire there. So I have the resistor and it goes back on the board in an area that is really quite inaccessible. Totally inaccessible. So my, my best move is to just try to try to resolder it. Maybe there is enough there to go back on. I can pull off the plastic cover that's on there. Bare wire laying right on it. Perfect. That, there's lots of there's lots. Okay, we'll just move that out of the way for now. I've got no kind of special tool to to go on this and, and tighten it. Let's snug it up first. Well, now the uh, wire's off. I can I can turn this whole thing. Can I? I cannot. There's some kind of a locking pin. A lot of these 
kinds of things that you, you can't afford to have rotate have some method of locking them in like a, like a pin that goes in a hole or something but this has still got this much play in it it's limited by something don't know what I have to think a little bit about how to how to get in here and tighten this some kind of tool. I mean, it, it, this is going to get worked when I put the uh, leads on. It's going to come loose again right away. Just like that. You would think they'd put a, uh, a lock washer on this somewhere, some way. It's pretty, pretty tight now. Hammering might do the trick there. Pull out my high school built hammer. Just kind of tap it a few times here. Tight. Realistically, how tight is it? Let's give it a, a test. Let's see what happens. It feels very secure. I wonder if tightening it up doesn't lock it into something that I can't see, or if there was a lock washer that's biting nicely now. Try that again. Okay, I'll, I'll be a little rude with it. Ooh, that feels really solid. Maybe it's the other way it comes loose. Okay, so... Ah, oh, it feels really solid. You think in the manufacturer of this, they would want to achieve that very very solid feel on this because again the technicians using this they would not be tolerant I say boss don't buy any equipment from that company again the connectors keep coming loose hmm. okay so we'll go after the other one did I just see something fall there in my imagination thing is really loose. Okay, it feels like there's a lock washer biting. That's what it feels like. Okay, let's give it a whack. solid. Give it another test. Feels pretty good. Okay, so all I gotta do is just solder back that connection and then it's and we'll put it through some tests and uh, Maybe, maybe make some adjustments in some of these uh, uh, adjustable uh, adjustments <laughs> in here. Right. Okay, so there's quite a few little things I want to do here, and uh, there is some logistics to the order of them. I'm probably not going to follow the logical order. Um, one thing is, uh, like most scopes, this has a test 
signal here. Uh, this is supposed to be one volt. We're going to take a look at that and see if it really is one volt. And of course, they can't really use the scope to do that because, well, isn't that really what we're testing to find out if the scope is accurate? But we need to know if this is accurate and what is here. Uh, that's trickier than it may sound. I think this is a square wave, but I'm not sure. So anyway, we'll take a look at that. I have a number of different test leads. I have some fairly new, uh, highly reliable test leads, but I have a couple of old guys sitting sitting right there that I want to try out. One of those has a adjustable compensation on it. I don't normally use those test leads. And then I have these uh, El Cheapo, uh, really not particularly good uh, leads, but I use these a lot in my shop. So I want to fiddle around with these a little bit too. Fiddle around, maybe that's the uh, name of the game here. Let's turn on the scope. Get it running. Like I mentioned before, there doesn't seem to be anything really seriously wrong with this oscilloscope, but uh, I've never really checked its calibration very, very much or whatever. Now it has a, a feature where uh, even if it's set to trigger and the signal level is uh, zero, or outside of the trigger range enough, uh, it will it will still trigger and put an image on the screen here. There we are, right there. Which one's that? There's two lines here. You might say, well, how does it do two lines? So some scopes, maybe, I don't really know, but some scopes may have two guns uh, inside the uh, back of the, of the CRT. Um, but I don't think this one does. This one has one gun. So how do you get two lines? So one way is you could draw one line, then draw the other line, then draw this one, then draw that one. Just do it fast enough, it ends up looking like what you see. But this one doesn't do that. This one switches quickly between the two of them. Uh, that's my understanding of it. Of course, I'll be reading up more on this scope, but very rapidly it's, it's, it's doing that, I think, I think. Um, Let's put one trace on. We'll get rid of this one. This one now. A little bit of dirt in the control. See, it's kind of jumpy there as I turn it. So I could clean some of these uh, controls up. That would probably be helpful. So we have no signal whatsoever. Let me start with one of the test leads that I believe is very reliable. This is not an expensive lead any means. So I purchased this fairly recently. 100 megahertz times 10 times 1 times looks like there's a ratio thing there. X10 something 600 volts peak. So that's probably the limit. Uh, you can use this on 600 volts. I don't encounter 600 volts. It has a switch on it for the times 1 and the times 10. And you flip it to the times 10, you have to multiply whatever you're seeing on your times 10 to get an accurate value. The benefit of putting this on times 10 is it's drawing, I hope, hope I'm saying this right, 10, one, one, one tenth of the uh, power out of the circuit you're testing. I hope I said that right. Okay, we'll stick it in this one. Yeah, stick it in here. Ooh, nice and solid. You know, I never soldered that, that other piece back yet. Uh-oh. Is this just one? Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, so I haven't, I haven't soldered this one, soldered that resistor back yet, so we'll just concentrate on on Y2. Look at see a lot of dirt in the control there. There we are. And we'll make a sensitivity, it's very high. We'll turn it way down to one one volt per division. Okay, we'll put it right on the test here and see what happens. As it's going away. Why is it going away entirely? Let's put this on 10. Let's make it less 
20 volts per division. Oh, I'm adjusting the wrong one. That's why. You see that zero is going all over the place? That indicates the DC balance is off on here. So we can deal with that pretty easily. There we are. So this is the, the between these two lines is the voltage here. So one volt. Can I clip this on here? No. This is kind of awkward. Set. So this is on one volt. Now, you can see better than me. I'm I'm looking from above. You're looking straight at it. Just you know, I can also see the CRT is, is rotated a bit. I'll have to rotate it back to get these lines. They're going up on an angle here. That's another little thing I need to do. But wow, that sure seems to be. I'm trying to get one right in the middle here, trying to get this right on the spot. Pretty good, looks pretty good. Looks exactly right, in fact, when I look at it. Now, if we go 0.5, we should see two divisions. Let me again, because of the DC balance, okay, I'm doing it from my terrible parallax view. Let me get down here. So we're right on this line and we're high on this line. Oh, it's floating around. Hold still, please. So I'm going to take this lead off. We're going to switch to the very simple cable here, mainly because I can clip it on that. Right on here, just a touch high here. So it looks to me. Let's adjust a little focus here. See if we can sharpen it up. Now there's an astigmatism control in the back. There isn't one on the front here, but somewhere in the back, of the machine is an astigmatism control. That a little bit of careful adjustment. It might sharpen those lines a little bit, but that's not bad. Okay, so we're getting very close to exactly correct. Assuming the output of this is exactly correct. Let me speed up the sweep. Oh, the sweep is called full tilt as it is. Let's go times 10 here. So I was wondering if I could see the switching between the two lines, but I don't see anything at all. So. Okay. So pulling this control out, this is this pull times 10, takes the screen and basically spreads it out so it's 10 times the size. And you can examine the signal still by using this control. There's one end. There's the other end. Wow, this thing got really tight. Okay, let's put it back. Get it in the middle. There we go. Okay, so I think the solder, a couple of uh, controls that need to be cleaned in here. So well, what's the problem with this? I don't think there is a problem. I mean, we're doing this even though I had it sweeping so quickly. Hmm, now we see it. Well, it looks to me like it's doing one and then the other. Let's see if we can stabilize this at the trigger level. I'm not sure. We're triggering on Y2. So there's three uh, filters here. Uh, the AC setting is no filter. So whatever's on the lead goes on the scope. This top one it filters out low frequencies. So it'll trigger on the higher frequencies. This bottom one, TVF, is uh, designed to, uh, or, or engages a filter that's intended to make looking at video signals in older televisions uh, to, 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 to make that easy on here. I'm not going to do anything for this, though. 
back on AC. Um, slow it down some more. No, that's not going to help. So when I look at that, it looks to me like it's trapezoidal. It doesn't look flat. Now that's a compensation issue. Let's just put this ground on here. Uh, it seems to be triggering properly. Take it off. Yeah, it's definitely triggering. It's sitting in one spot. Speed it up a little bit. That's excellent. Okay. Now we get a good look at it. So you see when it's drawing its image, it's really doing a bit of one, a bit of another, a bit of a bit of another. Of the other. A bit of the other. Still looks to me like it's a slight trapezoid shape, if that's the right word for it. Looking at this on another scope would be uh, you know, probably a, a good idea. See if it looks exactly the same on another scope. Now, fortunately, you know, I, I, none of my equipment is particularly calibrated. I can't, I can't swear to the calibration of any of it, uh, any of these scopes. Um, other equipment I've got is calibrated, but you can't use a regular voltmeter on this because it's a square wave here. And the voltmeter is calibrated for a sine wave to get the RMS equivalent uh, for a sine wave. So putting a voltmeter on here won't mean anything. Well, you know, I guess if you ask eight people and they give you the same answer, maybe you can trust that answer. So if I ask a couple other scopes, what's, what's this look like? Maybe uh, maybe we'll get an answer there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the other scope up yonder here and look at the same output on it. Okay, so I'm just going to simply transfer this connector up to the uh, scope up in the back there. I have a camera ready on it. Um, so far I haven't bothered with this ground lead because it's, it's happening internally anyway. Uh, maybe I better just clip this onto something here. Why don't we just clip it right here. Okay, here we go. hope this is long enough. This other scope, of course, is a newer, much better oscilloscope. Slow it down. Oh my gosh, it's uh, totally, totally different. It's way too high. There we are. Well, isn't that dramatically different? Now, why? Why is that so different? one or other of these scopes uh, it requires either an adjustment or the lead I'm using is uh, inappropriate for this. Uh, wow. Now, let's see if can, this scope to trigger. This scope has triggering problems uh, in my experience with it. it. Seems to have been getting just worse and worse over time. getting any trigger effect here. Uh, maybe I'm a bad operator or uh, it's, just, it's just giving up the ghost on triggering. So I won't sweat over that right now. You can certainly see the effect though. So there's two lines here because it's, it's just at a, uh, you know, I can adjust it like this. This is better. Yeah, that, that's a more realistic. And what we were seeing before was actually Two, two versions of it on top of each other. Now, big question is, is this a problem with the calibrated output on that scope? Or is this a problem with the scopes? Or is this a problem with the lead that I'm using? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, going to uh, you, you see this also has a similar test here. 300 millivolts, 1 kilohertz. So let, let's just move it onto that. So first, ground off. You can see, this looks like some RF popped into it there. Okay, and we're gonna bring this over here. I should put this ground on somewhere. I'll put it here. Okay, and the scope is looking at itself. 
That's what it's got going. Let's spread it out. A little bit of dirt in the control here. Well, that looks a lot better, wouldn't you say? I would say so. Oh, oh what happened there? A dramatic change. This is 0.2 and then 0.5. Well, that is <laughs> got my hands full now. Oh my gosh. This is supposed to be 300 millivolts. So if we put this on 0.5, that's as low as we can go right now. 0.5 per division. 300 millivolts, I'm assuming peak to peak times 10 magnification no, that's that's not what we're after so this would look like half of half uh, look like 0.25 probably 250 millivolts it's supposed to be three who's not telling the truth I'm the guy with two watches I have no idea what time it is Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to repeat this now with a uh, regular test lead. So I'm going to take this off of here. And we'll start with the scope we're looking at right now. And just explore all this before trying to decide what should or shouldn't be done about it. Okay, so this is now a nice test lead times one, go on there, I didn't hook the ground, ground up but it shouldn't really matter, but I will, I'll touch it anyway, yeah, it's not going to make any difference because it's, it's, it's the own, scope's own thing. Is there anything here that is not set off calibration? Everything looks good, so again it's not going to trigger. Because my poor, this poor scope won't, won't trigger. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. It's a fairly, a fairly low signal in here, maybe. That's, but if I do this, oh. Okay, so I changed to the other scope, other uh, test lead, and we're getting a much better response here. You can certainly see a bit of an angle to it. Wow, what's that telling me? Pretty interesting. I'm going to investigate these test leads today, too. Okay, now what do we do the opposite? We take this signal and stick it on the other scope. I, I, don't, I don't see the advantage of it. So, sure, the test lead really shows up, it has a problem. Uh, you know, the, the test leads have a capacitance in them, inevitably, of some amount. Let's put this on the times 10. Times 10. Now I can see a bit of a curve in that line. So uh, compensation not right somewhere. Now what do we got here? So got this little symbol here We're showing the ground. See it down here. But inside that hole looks like an adjustment. No, that's a that's a place for uh, plugging in a ground terminal. I guess that that is the ground terminal here. Never actually noticed it before. Okay, uh, what if I ground there? Mm, no difference. I'm gonna go back to the take take this lead, and I'll go back and put it on the other scope test point. Yikes! Yay! Oops, this is how uh, just a little bit tricky. So I have this ungrounded here. Let me ground it because I think it's picking up. Ooh! What was happening there? sure what happened there. 
There. What's that? Well, I use the scope like nothing all the time. There, I put the ground on it. You can see that. No. Don't know what's happening. Times one. We're off the scale. Okay, this is one volt now. No ground. Ground. Well, <laughs> it's you know who knows. You know. Which 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 is which here? Which is causing the problem? I'm gonna grab one of these old test leads. This this particular one I've grabbed has has this on the end of it. Inside that metal can is a little adjustment to compensate. So what am I doing? I want to put it on here to start with. This scope you're looking at now has a, an interesting feature, probably a common feature. If you screw the right kind of connector in there, uh, a uh, Tektronix uh, proper test lead, it'll automatically switch to times 10. I have times 10 leads that are, but, but this one won't do that. Okay, here we go. Let's start right here. So I just hooked it up right there. That's not looking very good. There it is. Wow, this is telling me I got all kinds of things here to deal with. There we are. Now the ground lead is actually missing on this scope. Scope lead, I don't use this one normally. ground. Maybe we'll clip it uh, just over here. Doesn't make any difference. Well, yeah, okay. 300 millivolts, 20 millivolt scale, 20 millivolts per division. 300 are supposed to be there. Uh, 20, if you divide 300 by 20, that's 30 by 20, that's 15, should be 15. Oh my gosh. What have I done here? Hmm. Maybe, maybe this is a times 10 lead, 10 times 10 test lead, I don't know. I don't know lots of stuff. Oh my gosh, the situation is much more complicated than I anticipated. Let's try another vintage one here. Okay, this one doesn't appear to have any adjustment for compensation. It says times 10 rate on it. It's not as bad as the last one in terms of the curve in the line of that. That's by some chance this an adjustment. No. Yeah. Wow. Nothing in there to adjust. So this little piece you see here, this is for putting extra fittings on. I don't have one. Is it the scope or is it the test lead? Gives you that. That curve. Or is it all me? Okay, going to the other scope. So one 
volt output. Make it a little brighter. All these curves, you know, what I'm looking for is a perfectly square wave. I'm not looking, you know, these curves are all indications of trouble. Trouble is about, I can kind of slow it down like this. Well, that doesn't look as bad, actually. It's just sharp right there. That's a 20, so we have 20 millivolts. It's supposed to be one volt. Well, this must be another another uh, test lead that's, yeah, it says 10 on it. It's the same one. Oh my gosh. Of course, they, these things are really only an issue if you're attempting very precise uh, measurements, and I'm, I'm typically not. I'm, I'm just kind of doing uh, uh, not quantitative measurements, just qualitative measurements with it. It's good to know this stuff. Let's put a real Tektronics guy on here. I have two of them. One has a very long lead on it. Let's do this one. When you look at it, 10 mega ohms, 6 feet long. US patent. The tricky thing about this is that this pin, this pin right here, this this pin makes contact with the outside here. Somehow that tells the scope to switch. If you watch, you watch the light here, watch what happens when I put this in. You see it jump? How smart is this oscilloscope? Okay, first of all, the, just hanging here open, we're getting kind of a messy deal. 0 0.2 volts, and it's showing messiness. Now that's my finger. It says right on the lead times 10. Okay, let's put it on here. Oh! So I push the ground button, it has a ground button on it. I push the ground button and it cleans up, of course. On. Let's try to stop it. Now that looks really nice. All the issues have gone away. That's pretty interesting. Use the uh, Tektronix leads, get a good view on your Tektronix scope. Now I'm going to go back to the other test lead here. So this is the calibration signal from the other scope. Started pushing the ground button by accident. And this looks more square. It still has that slope in it. It's lost the uh, the overshoot. That measurement. Suppose let's try the measurement here. So we're talking one, two, three, four, five, five. 5 times 0.2 is 1. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. Let's put this down. So it's right on the line. It's also just a touch high. That's both scopes reporting it just a touch high, like it's a little more than 1 volt. There. Okay, so I have one more test lead here to test. 
Now, if you're a technician and you work, you work in the modern radio industry and you're dealing with high frequency radios and stuff like that, uh, this is all, this is your lifeblood dealing with these kinds of things. Uh, no doubt you'd have a, a, your shop where you're working all set up properly so you don't get these kinds of problems. And the, the way I've dealt with it up until now is I've, I've ignored these problems uh, and just relied on simple, you know, kind of kind of a simpleton use of the equipment here. Okay, this is the other this is the other test lead. Ground button. We'll put it on here. Uh, let's start with the other scope. We we'll put on the other scope. And see the ground off, ground on. Ooh, what, what, what's going on there? Am I, am I pushing a button? Why is it occasionally we get these wild, wild stuff? I you know, I'm, all I'm, I'm not doing anything peculiar here. I'm just. I see the other scope up in the background if I just tip this a little bit. I'm just doing this. I'm sure that it kind of making contact. Well, I'm not exactly sure why sometimes I get a really wild display there, like that. What's going on? Any bad, bad contact in here? Perhaps that's what it is. Nice and square on the uh, upper oscilloscope. Now, let me try the same thing down here now. What if I take my superpower Tektronics CBX or R O L M Rome Corporation? Who are they? I want to go on here. I think I've ever connected this scope lead to this scope. Now we're looking here. This is a times 10 lead. So oh, my compensation is so bad. another 0.1 volts so that should be perfectly just about exactly right one division because this is at times 10 and it looks pretty good let's see if I can make it trigger will you trigger I'm trying not to put my hand in front of the camera there we are. Well, that's a thing. That's a thing of beauty. That is a thing of beauty. It's just perfectly square corners, and it looks like a flat, flat across the top. Let's go there. So Fifty millivolts should be two divisions now. Just a little bit high. It's just a bit more than a volt coming out of here. Okay, now we saw what is capable with these leads. This is a, quite a lesson for me. It's a tough one to get on and off. To go back to the worst thing of all, which I use regularly. No, actually, I don't use these. I don't use these regularly on the scope. Let's, let's put on just a very simple. Here. Put the 
come on, you know, the times 10 thing's gone, so we're going to go like that. And unfortunately, again, it's gone off the scale. We'll bring it down. Okay, so, see that the lines are like this, they're not parallel. Too much inductance, I think, is what that means, and uh, too much capacitance, or not, in, not enough capacitance, or something like that, affects the. Uh, the, the shape of the, of the uh, sharp, sharp, uh, the rise time, I guess I could say, or the rise. Around it to see what happens. Make, make a little difference. So that's probably not that bad a thing. I really have to study up to know how bad that is. Now we'll take one of these, uh, dare I call it a ch Chinese. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it came from China. Not knocking China. Too many people there to knock. Okay, now what happens if we use this one? This is set to times one. So you can see again the, the angle here. Okay, let's go for a vintage one now. Probably have to go around and around on this quite a few times. No, not not this. Not this. This one. This guy here. Big long lead. What do you say? So this is a times ten, then obviously. It says right there, ten x. So, okay, so times ten. Do manual compensation. That's pretty good. That's actually pretty good. And my other. Whoa! That's not good at all. That's not good. Not good. What just happened there? Lucky, lucky, lucky. Something didn't get broken. Many leads. Let me try this guy. One of the oscilloscopes I have is a Heathkit oscilloscope I built when I was in college. That scope is in a position to be used in another room. It's 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 really not. You really can't consider it a professional scope. So you can see what's going on now. We're getting these. Can you see that? getting curved here right at the like an overshoot let me let me hook up a ground here there's that weirdness again ground has no effect not surprised. Oh, it'll hang on there. It'll hang. No, it won't. <laughs> it'll hang on there as long until until it doesn't hang on. Wow. Okay. So with the highest quality or best scope leads I have, a hundred megahertz scope leads. These might only be like tens, ten megahertz. The hundred megahertz ones seem to produce a very reliable result go back to that. Okay. okay. It's that weirdness again. Well, there's a, just a touch of a curve right here. Uh, not an overshoot. I like usually would call that an undershoot. But not much. Okay, what do we learned here? We learned that if I want to make precision uh, measurements, uh, reliable precision measurements, I've got to be very careful about the leads I use. I can only use the uh, Hewlett Packard or uh, Hewlett Packard, the uh, Tektronix leads. And if I use the El Cheapo approach, you know, one like that, uh, it would be influencing what I'm seeing on the oscilloscope. 
I also notice this has drifted to the right while we've been on this. Is that, is that because I just didn't center it before? Well, I think that's it for now. Um, got too much here to think about uh, before I go forward. If I'm going to do any kind of alignment stuff on this scope, uh, I got to be sure about the test signal I'm applying to the scope. I got to be sure about a couple of things about it before uh, attempting anything. And that's basically the name of the game. And I got to rotate the the big tube here. Now, do I dare grab that thing while it's operating? There's something kind of interesting here I just noticed. There's a clear spot on the side of the tube. And you can actually look in. You're actually looking through through the side of the tube and seeing the, uh, the inside of the screen. Cheap throw. Just a cheap throw. Do I want to grab that and try to rotate it? Um, I think what I would rather do is look at it and say it needs just the tiniest of rotation. Switch it off. Give it some time for the high voltage to go away. That's a good indication that it's hanging on. You can still see it. You can still see it there. I don't want to get. To, I don't want to put my hands on that thing and. Uh, Go sky high. Okay, so I'll deal with that later. I'm going to let it sit for quite a while before I do that. And uh, think about how to approach uh, doing the... Uh, I'm going to read up on the manual too and uh, think about the approach I'm going to take to uh, making any adjustments that it might need in it. The obvious one is the... Is the uh, DC balance is way off. That's and some controls to clean. Okay, I'm done. Done for the day. Thanks a lot for watching. A bit of a goofy video, but uh, so be it.